Hey, hey, I'm Teresa Matsura, and you're listening to Uncanny Japan. Today, let me tell you a gently creepy Japanese ghost story. <laughs> It starts with a group of four university students. They all worked the same shift at their arubaito, or part-time job, at Staba, at Starbucks in Japanese. Over grinding beans and steaming milk, the four became fast friends. So much so that after work, they'd grab their own cup of coffee and sit around a small table in the back of the shop and talk about all kinds of things. There was something that connected them, something they all shared. Let's see if you can tell what it is. First, there was Akiko. She wore glasses and had long hair that she always kept tied back in a ponytail. Akiko was what they call in Japan a Haruki Suto, a devoted fan of Murakami Haruki. Some thought she was too solemn and a little weird. Akiko didn't care what anyone thought. Her best friend was Yumi. Yumi was effervescent, had a pixie haircut, and was crazy about guro kawaii fashion. Guro comes from grotesque, and of course kawaii means cute. Cutely grotesque. This mostly meant Yumi owned a week's worth of Gloomy the Bear in eyeball t-shirts that she wore on rotation. She also adored Ito Junji's work and always carried around a copy of his manga, Uzumaki. Then there was Kai. He was a tall, tan, good-looking young man. His father made him play baseball from the time he was five until he entered university where he was finally free. Here, he discovered movies. His favorite director was Miike Takeshi. During the holidays when most kids went home, he stayed in his dorm. His roommate would return to find him watching Ichi the Killer over and over, which made him a little nervous. And then there was Masa, Masa the Mouse, At least, this is what he was called from elementary school through junior high, the time he was bullied relentlessly. That is, until his family moved and he was able to start over. A shaggy-headed, skinny kid who really did resemble a mouse in his features and mannerisms. He was affable and eager to please. Masa loved death metal and punk. His favorite bands were Tentacle Centipede and Asphort. It was Masa, actually, who came up with the idea of the four friends doing a kimo damashi. Kimo is the word for liver, and tamashi or damashi means to test. In Japanese, to test your liver or your guts is a phrase that translates best as to do something really scary or to test your courage. I think we can all agree it's something young people, fearless and full of energy, enjoy doing. Buried deep in the mountains outside their city, which I'll leave unnamed, stood a tunnel that was a well-known Shinrei Spoto, or haunted place. Over the years, there had been so many freak accidents and tragic incidents in or around that old, narrow, Meiji-era tunnel that many believed the entire area was cursed. Eventually, the road to it was closed and a different route made to take its place. Closing it, though, didn't keep everyone away. Thrill-seeking souls sometimes went to search it out and to test their nerve. The ones who returned, though, all reported chilling or shocking accounts of what had happened while there. Their stories varied widely. Some spoke of hearing footsteps following them or feeling a tap on the shoulder. 
others heard whispering, giggling, weeping, or the sudden high shriek of a woman echoing through the cave. Tearful or tortured faces were briefly seen on the damp, mossy walls, and dark shadows were rumored to pass in front, behind, or even through other individuals. Kai thought the whole thing was bullshit. Akiko agreed with him out loud, but secretly wished it were true. Yumi wanted a good spooky image for Instagram and a story to brag about to her more conservative friends. Masa was just happy they could do something together. While there was no single agreed-upon legend about what exactly occurred if you dared to enter that old Meiji-era tunnel, there was one stern warning everyone stressed after leaving it. If you did make the trip and you did enter the eerie passageway, do not, under any circumstances, walk all the way through and exit the other side. But no one ever said why. The fateful day came to Akiko, Yumi, Kai, and Masa when they met for lunch, and that day's gloomy weather turned to rain. The four agreed it would make the trip even creepier and more memorable. It was unanimous. They skipped their afternoon classes, stopped by their apartments or dorm rooms, then met again at two to pile into Akiko's car. She was chosen to drive because she had the smallest vehicle and the mountain roads could get quite narrow and treacherous. Kai volunteered as navigator so he could sit in the passenger seat next to Akiko. Yumi and Masa, who collected as much information as they could find from friends, Nichan, or other internet rabbit holes, sat in the back. Everyone was in high spirits, retelling stories they'd heard or read and making themselves more and more excited and nervous. But after two and a half hours, the road narrowed to a single lane and became more windy. On their left, the wall of mountain occasionally spilled mud and tree limbs across their path, while to their right, a sheer drop-off fell away to who knows how far down. Akiko drove slowly, while Kai was now consulting a hand-drawn map that he downloaded. They'd all read that they'd lose their GPS signal at some point. And here it was. Three hours in, and Akiko was snarkily asking Kai if he'd ever read a map before. She was sure they'd missed a turn somewhere and were hopelessly lost. Yumi squealed every time they took a corner, and Masa wondered out loud things like, how were they going to turn around? Since the most recent photo he'd seen showed the tunnel was blocked off to traffic. And what time does the sun set anyway? Because it was five now, and the dreary day was steadily growing darker. Akiko told him to shut up. After a few minutes, Masa meekly added, At least there wasn't any traffic. Soon, though, the road forked, and Kai spotted the vine-strangled sign with the words Ikidomari, dead end, scrawled over the name of the tunnel. Their turn. Cheers erupted as they headed into thicker forest, leaning in from both sides. The road widened again, and then, all of a the sudden, there it was, right in front of them. Seeing it in real life felt kind of like a punch in the gut. The feeble yellow 
ghostly glow of an old-fashioned light hung over the round, utterly dark mouth of the tunnel, giving the whole scene an otherworldly feel. More than one of the four had the overwhelming and unexplainable urge to call it quits, to suggest why don't they just turn around and go back home. Only none wanted to admit this foreboding to any of the others, fearing what their friends would say. Always thinking ahead, Akiko was able to turn the car around so she wouldn't have to do it later when the light was even worse than it was now. She shut off the engine. This is it, she said. Scared and thrilled and filled with adrenaline, the four got out of the car and hurried over to the entrance. Ready? Kai asked. His phone's flashlight was already on. Go in together. Yumi took Akiko's hand in her left and Masa's in her right and sang out, One, two, say no. And they all stepped into the gloom at the same time. They were immediately enveloped in cold and the reek of mildew and rot. The fresh, forest-scented rain a second ago completely vanished, even though it was only one step away. The rounded walls and the low ceiling were made entirely of roughly cut stones, discolored from age and covered with moss and mold. Water ran down the sides or dripped into stagnant puddles on the ground. The four friends walked slowly into the darkness, noticing that even sounds behaved differently here. Their voices were too loud in their ears, but at the same time, a powerful, almost palpable silence thrummed around them. By now, they were all using their phone's lights, although it wasn't completely pitch black, not yet anyway. There was some light from the entrance still, and another single reddish-yellow bulb shone weakly up ahead, at what looked like the halfway point. Then, much farther on, another reddish glow at what must be the third lamp at the far end of the passage. Their goal. All they had to do was pass through, go out the other side, and take a photo to prove it. Then they could hurry back, hop into the car, make their way down the mountain, across town, and return to their everyday, slightly boring, normal lives. Only after entering into that tomb-like space, they had all sacrificed that innocent, safe life forever. They just didn't know it yet. They still believed this was a silly dare an urban legend. They walked on, the stale air growing increasingly harder to breathe. Unable to admit it to the others, every one of the four friends couldn't shake the feeling that they weren't alone in there. What's that? Akiko stopped and pointed. What's what? Yumi asked. A cat, or not a cat, something's crying. Yumi reached over and squeezed her friend's hand. You hear it, right? Akiko asked. But no one answered. Come on, Kai said. Let's get this over with. Yeah, yeah, said Masa, sticking close to Kai. I can't believe you guys can't hear that. Akiko continued. There it is again. Wind? Masa suggested. I mean, I hear rain. Kai and Masa in the lead. Step by slow step, they continued. At times, they took turns laughing nervously and making half-hearted attempts to frighten one another. 
only they were all quite unsettled already. The good humor and energy they'd had in the car wasn't coming back. Mostly, they were silent. Akiko, Yumi, Kai, and Masa were each lost in their own thoughts, wrestling with their own demons. As they neared the middle of the tunnel and the second spiderweb covered light, Yumi's feet began getting heavier. She kept turning to glance behind her. She had the feeling that the entrance wasn't only getting farther away, but was actually shrinking and sealing them inside. There was no way out. Icy panic welled up inside her chest, the ceiling close enough now that she could reach up and touch its slimy surface. It's spinning, Yumi said and dropped to the ground. You jump. Akiko knelt beside her cowering friend. What happened? The boys turned. Kai, making fist, was visibly enraged. What now? Akiko whispered in her friend's ear, trying to calm her. Go on, she said. Right now, all she wanted to do was get Yumi on her feet and get back to the car. Bugs, Yumi said under her breath. Your damned photo and let's get out of here. Akiko said to Kai and Masa, then returned her attention to her friend. She started brushing at her arms and face. Even the suggestion of insects now had Akiko imagining them, scuttling from the shadows and all over her skin and in her clothes. Hurry, she called after. It took some consoling, but Akiko managed to get Yumi back on her feet again. Then they heard a shout from the far end of the tunnel, and looked over to see the boy silhouetted against the eerie radiance of the third light hanging over the exit. The girls watched as Masa's animated form and Kai's taller, calmer one stepped outside. Beside Akiko, Yumi let out a blood-chilling scream and tore off back the way they'd come. Akiko, having no idea what had happened, ran after. Behind them, Kai and Masa shouted, and they also followed. It was almost as if the running excited and caused the thing or the things that were lurking in the sick, dark shadows of the tunnel to give chase. All four of them knew they were being pursued. All four of them didn't know if they'd make it out in time. And what if they didn't? It was night when they exited the old Meiji era tunnel. The four threw open the car doors and jumped inside, terrified that whatever was after them had followed them out. Go, go, Yumi said. But Akiko was already starting the engine and driving off. Everyone was silent for a while, until some distance was between them and the tunnel. Akiko spoke first. Is everyone okay? Yuchan, what happened? Why did you scream? But both Yumi and Masa stared out the back window. Yumi was trembling. Akiko turned to Kai. What did you see on the other side? What was so scary and dangerous that no one's supposed to go? Nothing, nothing at all. It just looked like this side, Kai said. For a long time... All was silent except for Kai and Akiko talking softly about the directions on the map. Once they were able to connect to GPS again, Kai found the nearest coffee shop and suggested they go there to regroup and calm down. There were three of you. Yumi spoke up. 
What? When I looked back at you and Masa, she continued, I saw three people's outlines, not two. Someone was with you. We're okay now. It was just your imagination, Akiko said. How do you feel? Better, much better. Yumi laughed, breaking the tension in the car for the first time. Hey, we made it out alive, didn't we? For a moment, the mood lightened. They came to a stoplight, and ahead of them sprawled the lights of a small town at the foot of the mountain. Everything felt okay again. Kai told Akiko the coffee shop was right ahead. Then Masa spoke. I saw him. Saw who? Yumi asked. She caught Akiko's gaze in the rear view mirror. The shaggy headed boy turned to look at Yumi in the eye. His face was white and he was sweating. It wasn't an accident, Masa said. Everyone thought it was an accident, but I lied, and they all felt sorry for me and they believed me. Masa Shikarishiro, keep yourself together. Kai could sense this was something that shouldn't be said out loud. He just wanted to get to some place where there were people and lights. He really just wanted to be under bright lights. I told you I moved because of a bully, but I didn't tell you why we had to move. What is he talking about? Akiko gripped the steering wheel hard. Stop, Yumi said. Please don't. It wasn't an accident. It was horrible, and when I went over to him after the fall, his eyes were open. He was still alive and he was looking right at me. He wasn't afraid, though. I just wanted to frighten him, but he looked at me with hate. Pure hate. Shh. Yumi patted his arm. He was ice cold. It's okay. Masa had tears in his eyes. When we stepped out from the tunnel to the other side, he was there, waiting for me. The same eyes, the same hate, the bloody face, the neck at that terrible angle. Stop, Masa, just stop, Kai said. He pointed at a gas station with a Tully's coffee shop and Akiko pulled in. I'm going to fill up, Akiko said. We still have a way to go before we get home. Yumi gasped. What are those? They all looked backlit all over the rear window were the outlines of dozens of handprints like someone had been hitting it trying to get in Kai called over the gas station attendant and asked him to wash them off and to fill up the car the only person in the coffee shop was a young barista who asked what she could get them tonight Kai ordered them all a coffee Then they went and found a table in the back of the shop. Listen, the past doesn't matter. You didn't see anything, Kai said to Masa. It was just your imagination. That place messes with you, messes with your imagination. Just forget it. I don't feel so good again, Yumi said. The gas station attendant came into the shop with a rag in his hands and explained that he was able to get off the handprints from the roof of the car and all but one from the rear window. No matter how hard he scrubbed, it didn't come off. Keep trying, Kai said, and the man left. In the background, they could hear the coffee machine whir. It was a familiar and relaxing sound to them. The smell of coffee, too, made it feel like they were almost back in the real world again not dragging pieces of some nightmare around. Masa seemed to be in shock and stared across the table. Yumi had reached over and was holding Akiko's hands. They gave each other a little smile. The gas station attendant returned and announced they'd figured it out. That last print, it wasn't on the outside of the glass. It was on the inside. 
They'd wiped it off, though, filled up the tank, and parked it right outside. He handed over the keys and left again. The four friends were still processing what that meant when the barista came over with a tray full of coffee. Large black coffee for everyone, she said, setting down the tray and placing the drinks in front of each one of them. Yumi gasped and put her hand over her mouth. It took a moment for Akiko and Kai to see what she had seen. When they did, the color drained from their faces. Kai pushed back from the table. Five. There were five cups of coffee. The extra cup was placed between Akiko and Kai where there was only an empty chair. An empty chair Masa had been staring at since they'd walked in. His eyes, Masa said to himself. His eyes. The end. The Other Side is an original ghost story that I wrote playing off some common Japanese scary tropes. I think it has legs, so I'm working on turning it into a short story or a script or something. All the editing and sound design was done by my partner, Rich Pav, who is absolutely brilliant at this. Speaking of brilliant, the coffee shop music especially that ending bit where the jazzy vibe slowly devolves into creepy and discordant notes, was made by my son Julian in like three hours or something. The ghostly voices you hear speaking Japanese in the tunnel, if you listen carefully, those were also Julian and his girlfriend Kaho-chan. He's a weirdo, but she was so great that I got chill bumps listening. And all of us are for hire, individually or as a team, just email me at uncannyjapan at gmail.com. We all thank you so much for listening. Please share with your friends, family, or anyone you think who might like this kind of thing. If you'd like to support the show, you can on Patreon where there's a lot of extra content. But there's also Kofi and Buy Me a Coffee too. Thanks again, and I will talk to you again in two weeks.